it is Father's Day. And technically, Father's Day is one of those secular holidays. It's not sacred. It was created by an American person less than 200 years ago, right? I'm not sure what date it was created. Probably less than 100 years ago. But it's a fairly recent holiday, and it's not a church holiday. And yet we often speak of it in the church, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with Father's Day. It can be helpful to remember our Father in heaven. After all, Jesus prayed to the Father in heaven. You remember that prayer, don't you? We say it all the time. But we say it in English, translated from Latin, translated from Greek, which was written after the fact when Jesus would have spoken that prayer in Aramaic. So we've lost a little along the way. Something interesting that I occasionally love to do with the words of Jesus is trace them back to the ancient Aramaic, to the root words, or at least the original words, and then sometimes to the root of those words to get better meaning. That's what I did this week with the Our Father. I read the prayer in Aramaic, and I was shocked. I was truly shocked. Because the first word of the prayer is avun, avun de bashmai, our Father in the heavens. But it's not our Father, because that would be Abbas or Abba. But it's avun. Does anyone have an idea what the word wun might mean in Aramaic? It's not too far from the English word that sounds a lot like it. Womb. It means a womb. So the Aramaic word for our Father in heaven is technically our ab, our Father, womb, our Father womb in the heavens. Now that's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Because we don't have a mother in heaven. And it's as if Jesus knew that a father without a mother would be incomplete in our worldly mind, so he takes the genderless God. We know God isn't a a man or a woman, right? God is spirit. God is, is all. So God, who's not really a man, we call him father, but we know God isn't just a man. Jesus has this creative way, at least when he originally recites this prayer to his friends, to immediately understand this being that we're talking to is both the life-giving womb, the mother that gives life and nurtures life, as well as the father who provides and protects and cares for that life. God can be all of those things at once. And if that seems odd to you, it's not much stranger than to read Genesis when God created Adam, or of the dust, which is a title, of course. As I've often told you, Adam and Eve are titles, not names, in Hebrew anyway. So the, the Hebrew name Adam is actually a title, and it means of the dust, the one of the dust. And now all humans are called people of the dust because God took something formless and he formed out of it. He took something lifeless and he breathed his own spirit into its nostrils and gave it life. But what we don't often take time to remember is that from Adam, God created Eve. God did not make Eve out of the dust. Exactly. She was mad I forgot about women for a moment there. Uh, and, And that's the point. Women were not separate created beings out of the dust. Now, this might seem trippy to some of you if you've never thought too long about it, but God took Eve out of Adam. So Adam originally was both man and woman. He was created in the image of God, and God was without gender. And so God created a human without gender, just all of it in one person. And then God said, that's not good. A human shouldn't be self-contained like that. There has to be a partner, a help meet suitable. There has to be another half. You can't just have it all in one. So God took woman out of man, and when he woke up from the deep slumber, what's the first thing out of his mouth? She's me, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For God had taken her out of man, and he gave her a womb so that she could give life, and then Adam could work the ground and take care and feed that life. And so together they were helpmeets suitable. They were partners, and together they illustrated the beauty of God. And so you can't have... Mother's or Father's Day separately. They, they always have to be intertwined. But the sad reality is that they're not in real life often intertwined successfully. Even families that have both a mother and a father in the house often have a lot of problems. And one of the parents can drop the ball, if not both. And the sad truth is most families today are not the typical mother-father scenario. There are often grandparents chipping in, aunts and uncles, adoptive parents, uh, kids in and out of foster care and, and orphanages. And, uh, I'm the product of, of a broken system like that. My dad was in and out of foster care. So I, I understand this, and, and I see the harm that can be caused by breaking down that system that God created. But I also see the beauty when people move beyond these, what I would call sort of toxic or limiting ideas of what a man and a woman must be, 
There are men and women, but let's open our minds to the fact that fathers can be nurturing just like mothers, and mothers can be protective just like fathers. And, and perhaps remember, we all came from one God, and we may overlap at times. And I think that's okay, because God created that to work sort of symbiotically and beautifully to provide all that a child would need. So I think it's good on Mother's and Father's Day to remember mothers and fathers on each of those days and the ways in which some parents have to be both at times. So whatever you understand about it, I guess what I'm telling you is I feel guilty that I didn't preach a Mother's Day sermon on Mother's Day, but we were doing the VBS messages. So today I'm combining the two and I'm doing a parent sermon for fathers and mothers, a parent sermon, and for grandparents and for adoptive parents and for guardians and and for some of you who never have children, but you are a spiritual guide to other people. And for some of you who parent those you work with, my cousin would call her boss her second dad. And he wasn't her father, but every day for 19 years, he just died this week. My cousin said every day for 19 years, she looked to him as a father. And she would run ideas by him, and he gave her life advice and took her on trips because her father struggled with alcoholism and her mother died of breast cancer. So she needed somebody. Some of you are that person even if you don't have biological children. My point is, we could get a lot out of Father's Day if we let it be a little less secular and a little more Christian. To that end, basically to understand God as the ultimate parent, the abwun, the, the perfect father and mother all in one, the perfect parent, to understand God in that way and to try to imitate that parental love, Solomon gives his own son wisdom in Proverbs. And if I'm not mistaken, this is my friend Jim Euler's favorite verse. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and God will make your path straight. How many of you have heard that before? Yeah, that's, I think that's a good text for a Father's Day. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and God will make your path straight. So the first line, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. That's a challenging word for Christians because we have taken the concept of trust, fidelity, loyalty, faithfulness. It can be translated all those ways. We've taken that in the modern New Testament era and we've often boiled it down to beliefs. And we've taken faith, which really is more like faithfulness, and we've turned it into believing things. So that when we say trust in the Lord, what we mean is believe things about God. And that's such a short-changed view of faith, because faith is loyalty and trust. So the first thing Solomon says to his son and to all sons and daughters, to all of us, is that the first thing we need to do is learn to trust God, to depend on God. Now, we would call that faith in the New Testament church, but we don't just mean your faith as in what you believe about God. We mean your ability to lean on God, to trust God. God. To trust God is to hand things over to God. To trust God is to quit trying to do it yourself, which is why the second line is going to talk about not depending on your own understanding. To trust God is to not trust other people and other sources of authority. So I guess my first question is, do you know how to trust God in your life? Have you exercised that ability? Have you given things over to God in faith? Have you believed that God has your best interest at heart so that in any circumstance you could be grateful and give thanks to God? Have you, in moments of crises, have you been able to teach trust in God to others, especially children or grandchildren? Have you been able to show in these moments the the first thing you need to remember is that God is with you. You don't have to worry right now. You don't have to be anxious. I guess the first step, mental health-wise, Solomon realizes the first step to breaking through as a good parent is to break through anxiety and fear, and we do that by trusting God. Until you trust God, you will be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. How many of you would say you have suffered from fear and anxiety? Any willing takers? Yeah, most of us, right? I'd say all of us in some degree. We all suffer from fear of various sorts. We all suffer from anxiety, sometimes crippling anxiety that keeps us from doing and being the people, doing the things and being the people we ought to be. The first step to overcome that is trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. All your heart. All your heart. Not almost all. I think far too often Christians settle for some instead of all. When we talk about God, And his love for his children. We say God loves some people. 
But we know God loves all people and desires that all might be saved. We love to say that, but we settle for some. Now that's getting into missions and evangelism, which I think is a good topic, that if God wants all to be saved, then we have to reach all people, not just the ones near, not just the ones that are easy to talk to, all people. But we settle for, for less than all in many ways, perhaps in this way, our hearts. When we say we trust God, what we mean is we trust God sometimes with some of the stuff, with some of our heart. And what the Bible commands is that we trust in God in every way, all the time, with all of our heart. That's hard. That's near impossible, the side of eternity. But it's the command that we're given. Trust God with all your heart. So I wonder if you reflect on this Father's Day as you consider your Father in heaven, the great Avun de Bashmayim, this Father womb in heaven. When you think of God, this parent who cares for you, can you trust God more today than you did yesterday? Is there perhaps an area in your life that you have not been trusting God and you feel nudged by the Spirit this morning to give it over, to trust God more, to give up the anxiety and the fear and the frustration and the anger? Trust God with all your heart. Teach others to do the same. We teach best by example, by the way. So if you're wondering, how do I teach these things to the next generation, whether they're your kids and grandkids or someone else's that you influence, you teach them by doing it. You teach them through example. You must learn to trust God, and they will see in you that trust, and they will want to imitate it. I bet if you stop for a moment, you could think of people that have trusted God deeply in your life, and you probably admire those people. You could probably write down a name or two right now of, of someone that you know or a couple of people you know who trusted God no matter the circumstances. And it compels you to do the same. Be that person for someone else. The second line is that you should lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. Leaning, in Hebrew it's shachan. Shachan means uh, to lean upon, like on a staff. But the way it's used by Solomon is the way it was used in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And it's what kings do when they seek advice. When they go to a brazier or some kind of uh, kingly advisor, and they say, I need to lean on you for wisdom. So they use that verb, shachan, to lean upon. Solomon, who's a great wise king, tells his future children and, and all of us, God's children, to lean on God and not on our own understanding. If you're looking for somewhere to lean when you need a crutch, when you don't know and you don't have a leg to stand on, what are you going to lean upon? What will be your crutch? And Solomon basically says, it's either going to be God in heaven or your own understanding. Why not your own understanding? I would think my intentions are good. I would think I have a decent understanding of God's will. Why would I not be willing to trust myself? Surely I want what's best for me, so then why can't I trust my own understanding? I think you know the answer to that, don't you? Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're misguided. Sometimes feelings overpower facts, and it's hard to see clearly. Sometimes you're ignorant of the truth, and you just don't know better. There are a lot of reasons that we should be careful not to lean on our own understanding. But I think it's more than our own understanding. I think Solomon is implying the world's operative system, the way the world understands things. That's what he means by yours. I think he means humanity's understanding. We want everything to be individual. God's telling me, don't trust what I think. But my nature isn't to just trust what I think. It's to trust what I've been told and taught and what I've seen from others. But even that is faulty. Even that is imperfect. Don't lean on your understanding. Don't lean on those around you when there's a perfect God that you can lean on who has given counsel from heaven. You can think of all different ways that we've leaned upon others and ourselves in our own understanding. I would give examples, but I think you can come up with them. The world's answers and systems are imperfect. Even when intentions are good, when people try to give you counsel, when you want to lean on an advisor, even then you should use caution because they might be wrong, even if their intentions are good. But the truth is sometimes intentions are not good and people give us bad counsel on purpose. We don't want to admit that, but it happens. We have to point people to God, who is the ultimate parent, the one we can lean on, the one who has perfect divine counsel in every situation. 
And there are times where you wonder what God's will is. And then you pray and you fast and you seek God. And you acknowledge that God was there even when you weren't sure where God was. You acknowledge God in all your ways. We can't lean on our own understanding, even though it's our nature to assume that we're right or that the sources we hold in authority are right. You know, I don't know what your sources of authority are. If I wanted to dig in deep this morning, we could get political. And I wonder if you think a party, a political party, somehow is going to save the world or fix things. They may do some good, but don't lean on that as your crutch. If only we could get this person voted into office, then everything would be better. Uh, maybe it's medicine and health care. Very helpful tools in our lives. But you can't lean on those things as a permanent crutch. They can extend life. They can reduce pain. They can help you recover from ailments. But medicine is, is a practice, and it will never keep you alive forever. Maybe it's your spouse or your children, and you lean so hard on those people that they begin to buckle. Or when they move on, whether you become an empty nester or your spouse, God forbid, leaves you for any reason or perhaps dies, then where will you lean? These things are not bad or inherently evil. They're all necessary parts of life, but if that's your crutch, then as soon as the crutch is removed, you fall down. And so Solomon says, lean not on your own understanding, meaning do not lean on humanity. Lean on God. But it is our nature to lean on ourselves to trust the wrong sources of authority. And I would argue that's the real problem we see in society. It's not lost on me that some of you were uh, watching pride parades this week and things like that and have all kinds of opinions about how the church should respond to these things. When people boycott Bud Light and Target stores and all, all that kind of stuff, when they put uh, Joe Biden sucks stickers on every gas pump and all this, you know, you've seen it. When you live in that world, how are Christians supposed to respond to that? I have to wonder. I think we could join the mob rule, and we could blame all those people. You could blame public education. You could blame Joe Biden and the administration. You could blame pride rallies and people who are, who are uh, seemingly targeting children. And, and certainly, I do not support targeting children. But uh, not necessarily do I support any of this stuff uh, in, in the sense that much of it can be damaging in our society and in our culture. But you know what it is, whether right or wrong, it's scapegoating. It's placing blame somewhere else as a crutch. Because I don't have to stand for myself if I can just lean on the negativity everyone else has afforded me. If I can blame everything around me, then I don't have to look in a mirror. I don't have to consider how I play a part in this. And I can sort of numb myself to what's happening all around me in the world. Christians do it all the time. It's delusional, really. We know that we've fallen short and we need help. And we think that by telling the world not to believe these people or those people and to blame these people and to blame those people, that we are teaching them not to lean on their own understanding. But in fact, we are doing the exact opposite. We are leaning on our own understanding of the world and completely leaving God out of the picture. Or we use God as, as a bully to prove our point. I saw something that broke my heart this week, and, and I know some of you probably shared it on Facebook, so this is not personal. It wasn't any of you that, that I saw that posted it. Someone had posted a rainbow flag and said something about how the rainbow is, is a sign of God, a promise in Genesis 6 and Genesis 9, a promise that God would not destroy humankind again because he loves humankind. And I thought, amen. Yes, let's re retrieve the beauty of the rainbow and what it really represents, God's love for humanity, that God does not want to destroy humanity. And then someone else copied it and shared it and added, because next time when God comes, he will destroy humanity with fire, not a flood. And then everybody started sharing that. And, and I'm quite certain there were some of you in this church that probably shared that and thought it was a great message. And as soon as I read it, I teared up because I thought, how many people read this and what could have been the actual scriptural promise in Genesis which was beautiful, that God loves humanity and has plans to save us from ourselves, turned into God hates humanity, and you thought, you thought a flood was bad? Wait till he burns you alive. And now that's the picture we give people of God. What is that? That's humans projecting our own failure into the world and onto everybody else because we need a crutch, because we have to lean on something in this world 
because it's far too difficult to lean on God and be exposed for who we are and have to learn how to actually stand on, on our own with God's help. I get it. And I also know some of you aren't quite ready to hear that. So parents, back to mothers and fathers in the room, grandparents, guardians, quit placing blame and try to teach your children. Instead of discussing why everything's wrong, show them how to make it better. Set an example of making the world better. Teach them how to make it better, how to have a hard, good work ethic, how to respect others, how to develop self-dignity, self-respect. Encourage them, train them, give them tools, the ones that you have to share. That could be literal tools that you help them to use, but, but you know what I mean, tools that figuratively, the things you have learned in life that have helped you. Share those. Remind young people every day of their value, of their inherent beauty, of their inherent worth in the eyes of God. And I mean that for both boys and girls, because guys try just as hard to prove themselves as girls do in this world, and it's not healthy. And that's because they don't know where to lean, because no one's showing them. Be diligent in relationships. Help the people in your life be better than you have been. I think that's what Christ would encourage us to do. And the most important thing you can teach anyone, but especially children, is to trust in God and to lean into the wisdom of the divine. The sad thing is, we don't. Many of us are not teaching our children or grandchildren how to be people of prayer and service, how to be students of the word of God. We're not teaching them faithfulness to worship and fellowship. Some of you are, certainly, and some of us are not, and all of us could probably do better. But I wonder, perhaps, if people don't do it because they weren't taught to do it themselves, because no one taught them, and so now they don't know how to teach the next generation. That's a true struggle. If no one taught you, how do you teach others? I'm trying to show my kids how to build things. Yesterday, we were working outside, uh, and I was trying to teach Hudson what sockets and ratchets were, and I thought... I don't know that my dad took a lot of time to try to teach me things. He was pretty impatient, and I was kind of dumb and lazy. And so as a kid, he would just do it himself. And now I look back and think, what a missed opportunity. I could be so much smarter today and more capable. I've, you know, I've done okay, but I wonder how much he could have given me that, that we missed out on. And that was both of our faults. But what could you be giving someone that could stick with them the rest of their lives? Certainly in their relationship with God. And then I, I wonder if it's not just you haven't learned how to do it in your own experience, but you feel hypocritical doing it. Yeah, you could show a kid how to change their oil when they start driving or check the dipstick. You could teach, you know, teach uh, housemaking skills and, and you know, laundry and stain removal, whatever. You know, everyday stuff, balancing a checkbook. You can teach all that. But then how can I teach my kids and grandkids to be spiritually mature if I'm not or if I don't feel it? If I don't feel that I'm where I'm supposed to be with God, I know how to balance a checkbook. I can teach them that. But I don't think I'm the Christian I'm supposed to be, so how can I teach them to be good Christians? I don't pray enough. How could I teach them how to pray? You, you feel that hypocrisy. And I think that is a barrier that many parents and grandparents struggle with that keeps them from training the next generation how to be faithful stewards of God's grace. Maybe you've experienced hardships and doubts and you feel that it's difficult to tell someone to lean on God when you haven't always leaned on God, when you've often held a different crutch. So Solomon writes that last line, and it's like our saving grace. Acknowledge God in all of your ways, and God will straighten your paths. It's as if Solomon says, I know once you get through A and B, you're going to feel a little hopeless, so I'm going to jump you right to Z. In the end, God's going to straighten it out. You start to think, trust God, lean on God, and not on the human's understanding in this world. And then you see all these crooked lines in your life, and you think, who knows where I've been and where I'm going? And Solomon says, now wait a second. If you will acknowledge God, that God is present with you, even when you fail, even when you don't trust, even when you don't lean properly, God is going to straighten it out in the end. Just acknowledge God, and God will do the rest. It's, it's like a cop-out, but we call it grace. It's the mercy of God. It's not an excuse to be a bad parent. But it is salvation for bad parents, that God can help straighten it out, that God has promised to, that he can do it for us, he can do it for our kids, he can do it for our grandkids. What does it mean to acknowledge God in all your ways? 
At the end of movies, they always roll the credits, right? Those are acknowledgments. These people made this film possible. You wouldn't have been able to sit and watch this two-hour movie if it weren't for months and months and months of work from all these countless people. The same is true of a book. Any decent author has an acknowledgments page. I thank my spouse and my kids for being patient. I thank the editors for helping proofread. I thank this person for inspiring me in college to write this book 10 years later. And, you know, the, the acknowledgments page. You have to give credit because we understand we didn't do it on our own. That's what good parenting looks like, leaning on God and teaching our next generation to lean on God and to trust God by acknowledging God's presence throughout the process. Whether we did good or not, whether we succeeded or failed, God was with us. God gets credit. God should be at the top of every credit list, every acknowledgement list for every person ever, because you only exist because of God. And so Solomon says, if you're going to remember to give credit to somebody, give it to God, because God can work it all out. My dad, who's no longer with us, uh, he spent over 100 days and nights in a hospital. He got swine flu many years ago. You guys remember swine flu? It was before COVID ever came. I mean, it was actually a form of COVID. But anyway, he got swine flu, and it almost killed him. He had eight bilateral strokes and lots of fluid in his lungs, and it was a horrible thing. They, they told us he was sick and brain dead, and we should pull the plug. The neurologist came in two hours later and said, give it a chance, let's wait a few days, see if anything changes, and then you can make that difficult decision. So we waited, and we prayed, and we prayed. And miraculously, my dad began to twitch a finger, and then a couple of fingers, and then weeks later, he was squeezing his hand, and then he eventually was talking, singing song lyrics from memory. And after a hundred days and nights in the hospital slash rehab at the hospital, he finally got to go home with some, some you know, serious daily care from my mom. And he lived that way for another four and a half years, and he saw both my daughters and almost saw Hudson's birth. Uh, so it was, it was a blessing, and I praise God for that every Father's Day. But there's one of my favorite stories is when he was in rehab before he had ever gotten home, when we still weren't sure that he would be able to go home, and we thought he might be in a nursing home forever. And they were trying to help him sit up in bed, and they used a wedge. You can imagine a, a pillow wedge. They used a wedge to help hold his back, and then they would say, we're going to count down from three, and we're going to remove the wedge, and you have to hold yourself up. My dad would say, okay, okay, I'm ready. And uh, he, he only knew about 10 words at that point that he could really speak, and most of them were four-letter words that I can't say in church. Well, they pulled the wedge out from behind him, and he went, and he started falling backwards, and he yelled one of those words out loud, and, and the whole floor, rehab floor, started cracking up laughing, and, and it was embarrassing for him. He felt humiliated. He, he couldn't hold his own body weight up on a bed without falling backwards. He was uh, completely flaccid on one side of his body the rest of his life. So long story short, they tried again and again until he built enough core muscles on one side at least that he could control, that he was able to hold himself up for so many seconds. And they'd count, you know, let's remove it in three, two, one, and now one, two, three. And he would sit as long as he could, and they'd count down. And, and I want to say the first goal was maybe 10 seconds. Once you can sit up for 10 seconds, you know, we'll celebrate with you. And he finally did it. One day he finally sat up and he just kept sitting up, and he was doing it without anyone helping him. And they said, you did it, Joe, you did it. You sat up on your own for 10 seconds. But by that point, my dad knew better than anybody that he had never in his life done anything on his own. He had never sat up, stood up, or done anything by himself. Because by that point, my dad knew all through his life, God had been with him. But he hadn't realized it until that day. And he was changed. Acknowledge God in all your ways, and he will straighten your paths. We depend on God even when we don't appreciate God's care. We exist because God desires that we exist. That's good news. That is good news. None of you got here on your own. We depend on God. We depend on the people that God places in our path. But you don't do it yourself. And God says he will never leave you nor forsake you. Let him be your crutch so you never falter. In the fire and in the storm, God is there. In the valley of the shadow of death, God is there. As my favorite hymn says, when comforts flee, God still abides with me. 
when friends fail me, God still abides with me. God is always there for you. Acknowledge that. Acknowledge that God is Abun, the perfect parent in heaven, that he gives life, sustains life, cares for you, loves you, and has good plans for you. On this Sunday, especially, you who fill the role of a parent, or even more specifically, fathers and grandfathers in the room. Perhaps you should spend Father's Day not getting to go wherever you want and eat whatever you want, but perhaps, like our Father in heaven, you should use this day to be the most selfless, loving father you know how to be, and to dedicate yourself to those in your life. Love and encourage and help and have fun and communicate honestly and set a good example and celebrate the gift that is life. I said at the beginning that Father's Day is secular, and technically I guess it is, but I'm believing more and more that it could be one of the greatest sacred holidays we celebrate, if it is in fact a celebration of our Father in Heaven, if it is a moment to honor and to imitate God then the church should take every chance we can to do so. Would you stand with me? And I want to read one more scripture as we close. This is uh, John 15. It's from the Gospel of John. Jesus spoke these words. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments then you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus says, this is how the love of the Father works. You abide in it by obeying the commands. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy, your joy may be full or completed. God wants to complete the joy in you so that when you and God come together, it's joy meeting joy. That's God's intention for you. And Jesus says, just to be clear, this is my commandment. In case you're wondering, well, how do I do this? How do I abide in the love of God? The commandment is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. Would you pray with me? Lord, may every day be Father's Day if it means celebrating and imitating your love. Let each day be Father's Day if it serves as a reminder to love others as you have first loved us. Whether we are fathers or not, we could do nothing greater for your glory or for the good of those around us than to love them with your love. So help us as we follow the example of Christ our Lord. Amen.